evening, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus, always to be with you here in Bournemouth is indeed a blessing. Thank you for joining us tonight. One or two Martha things before the Mary things. Tomorrow at 11, I'm uh, at Crossways Church. Pastor Fred is here. He will give you information how to get there. If you don't have a church tomorrow when you're in the Bournemouth or Wimborne area, you'd be more than welcome to worship with us tomorrow at 11. 10.30, at, oh, 10 sorry. I'm showing up at 11, brother. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Avino Mankeno, a nakdim odim laha, Bishfrikol, a brochot, a nakdim kibalim imha. To da bishfil et slav, to da bishfil abdan shaha mashiach yeshua, meshicheno, shenishpach bishfilino. To da, the dvarecha, to da, she yeshua, who you vow, bahazara, who you vow, the teeth karov. Anna Adonai, to spoke with her hefe aleno, if gosh itano akshav. אנחנו רוצים לשמוע לדבריך על ידי ישוע האדון בכוח ובאור של רוק הקודש שלך. בשם ישוע אנחנו מתפללים. אמן. Father, we thank you for your wonderful salvation and all of your goodness and blessings to us. Tonight, Lord, we wish to come before you that your name will be glorified in our midst. Your people edified. And that you would speak to us, Lord, not any man, but you would speak to us by your spirit through your word. As always, Lord God, let us put these things to good use in your kingdom service, glorifying you in these last days. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. We're looking tonight at the silver trumpets. The silver trumpets. We have two kinds of trumpets in the word of God. We have two. They must be understood as being distinct from each other. A lot of times, or probably most times, most believers who even take thought of such a thing do not understand there's a tremendous difference between the two kinds of trumpets. One kind, is that working? Is that working? Yeah. Shofar. Shofar. A shofar is a ram's horn. It's not something that people made, it's something that God created directly. A shofar. A shofar is famous, of course, from the book of Joshua. When we understand the use of trumpets and their symbolism and their meaning eschatologically to do with the return of Jesus in the New Testament and in the book of Revelation particularly, it's imperative, we understand, is it speaking of a shofar or is it speaking of the second kind of trumpet, the silver trumpet. The silver trumpet in Greek is called, and in the Septuagint and in the New Testament, solapigo. Atzutot in Hebrew, ram's horn, silver trumpet. What is the difference? The ram's horn is blown liturgically at fixed periods of time. Somebody called the Baal Tekua begins practicing with it in the week before Rosh Hashanah, originally the Feast of Trumpets in the autumn. He begins practicing because at Rosh Hashanah, Yam Truah, he must blow a distinct series of notes that introduce Hayamim Hanoraim, the terrible days, which have a specific meaning for the last days concerning Israel. If I had a shofar, I could blow it for you if I practiced, but the notes have to be of a specific length, 
and pitch. Has to be exactly right. That's one that's blown. However, on the year of Jubilee, on Yom Kippur, it's also blown. So it's blown liturgically at fixed periods of time. But the Salapigo is different. The Salapigo could be blown anytime. Anytime. Unlike the ram's horn, the shofar, which was created directly by God, the silver trumpets were made of human craftsmanship. They were made of human craftsmanship, and they could be blown at any time. Hence, when you see things like at the last trumpet, Christ will return and so forth, which is it speaking of? We do not know the day or the hour of his return. We can't know that. The ram's horn is blown on specific days. It is not the ram's horn that speaks of the rapture and resurrection. It is the salapigo. But the ram's horn is important eschatologically. I apologize to those who know this. Our regular people would know it. But we have some visitors. Again, if a Jewish believer was reading the book of Revelation at the end of the first century, he would have understood it as a midrash on Joshua. Remember, there's no chapter divisions in the original Greek text. So if he began in chapter 8, where well, we would put chapter 8, verse 1, and he read 8, 9, 10, and 11, he would have seen a pattern. In the book of Joshua, when they marched around Jericho, there had to be total silence. Hence, when the pattern begins with the trumpets in Revelation, he heard silence in heaven for a half hour. How you apply time to eternity is a different issue. I won't even touch it today. It would require too much time. But you see the pattern. Secondly, they had to march around Jericho seven days. But the seventh day, there was a subset of seven. They had to do it seven times. So from the seventh seven, there was a subset of seven. So too in the book of Revelation, you have seven seals. But from the seventh seal is the subset of seven trumpet blasts. Same pattern. The seventh seven has a subset of seven, follows the same numerical pattern. You have the metaglime, the metaglime in Joshua. The two spies. Whoever those two witnesses will be in the book of Revelation, we have to understand that many people foreshadow them. Many people foreshadow them. The two angels that rescued, that appeared in human form and rescued Lot and his family foreshadow the two witnesses. The two spies that rescued Lot and his family foreshadow the two witnesses. Zerubbabel and Yeshua from the book of Zechariah foreshadow the two witnesses. Some people have the mistaken idea that the two witnesses are in the second half of the last seven years. No, they are in the first half of the last seven years as the early church began, uh, believed. We know this from Hegesippus and so forth, that the, church, the earliest church fathers, closest to the apostles, said it was believed in the apostolic church that the two witnesses would be in the beginning. Now, this, of course, relates to things like the spirit of Elijah and so forth, but these two spies who rescue Rahab and her family foreshadow, prefigure, something about the two witnesses or rescue. When they blow the last trumpet, the last blast in Joshua, the walls came tumbling down. So, this city has been given to us by the Lord. When the last blast is blown in the book of Revelation, What does it say? 
This world has become the kingdom of our God and his Messiah. It's the same pattern. We deal with this on the scarlet cord teaching, which prefigures the rapture and resurrection, the rescue of, Lot, of Rahab and her family. In any event, that is the shofar. Those trumpets are prefigured by a shofar. We have to deal with the salapigo. We have to deal with the silver trumpets. Everybody clear? Turn with me, please, to Revelation chapter 1. Verse 10, please. I was in the spirit in the Lord's day, and I heard on back of me the loud voice like the sound of a solapigo, a trumpet. Turn with me, please, to 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 4. Verse 16, please. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet, the solipigo of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now sometimes solipigo is translated into English translations as bugle, bugle, but it, or it's trumpet. Some translations, in some places, bugle, but it's, the Greek word is always solipigo. Verse 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be harpezot, raptured, caught up. I just finished the book on the rapture, will be out later this year, called harpezot, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord, therefore comfort one another with these words. So in Revelation 1.10 and here in 1 Thessalonians, we see the rapture is associated with with the Salapigo. Turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <laughs> Commencing in verse 51, please. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Sleep being a metaphor for the death of a believer. Unsaved people die. Christians go to sleep. If you're not born again, you're going to die. If you are born again, you're going to go to sleep, unless the Lord comes first. If you go to sleep, you wake up again. Now, there's more to it than that, but the scriptures do not speak of the death of a believer as death. Death is for unsaved people. Death is for non-Christians. Christians die. Lazarus is asleep. Talita, Takumi, the little girls asleep, do not be overly grieved for the brethren who are asleep. Death does not concern us in the sense it does unsaved people. When you see a funeral cortege, a hearse driving by, when you go by a cemetery or a funeral parlor, it doesn't matter. Your funeral is over when you were baptized in water. Your funeral is a past event. It doesn't concern the saved Christian. Those things are for unsaved people. And that's only the beginning of their problems because real death is second death. Real death is second death. In eternity, the only birth that will matter is second birth. And the only death is going to be second death. In order to escape the second death, you must have the second birth. In eternity, the only birth that's going to matter is second birth. The only death there will be is for unsaved people, second death. Death is for non-believers. It is not for the people of God who put their faith in Jesus and repented of their sin. Well, let's look. 1 Corinthians 15, what does it say? It says, verse 52, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last, the last, Salapigo. The trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For the imperishable must put on the imperishable, and the mortal put on immortality. 
One more in the New Testament. Look with me to the Olivet Discourse. Matthew 24, please. The words of Jesus. Verse 31, he will send forth his angel with a great trumpet. This relates to Revelation 14, of course. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Hence, repeatedly, we've looked at four times, the New Testament associates the rapture and resurrection with the trumpet, with the last trumpet. It is a salapigo. It is represented by the silver trumpet, as we'll see in a second. It is not a ram's horn. The ram's horn are the judgments. People made the silver trumpet. God makes the ram horn, the ram's horn. The ram's horn are signals of God's judgment on the non-believer. The silver trumpets are God's signal to believers. Okay. The ram's horn release God's judgment on the unbelievers in the book of Revelation. The silver trumpet are the signals to his people. Okay. Now, the ram's horn is blown on Shana HaYovel, on Yom Kippur, but there's a reason. Because Yom Kippur is not only going to be the liberation of God's people, but it will be the day of vengeance of God against the unbeliever. Separate subject. We explain it on the new teaching we have on the year of Jubilee. Perhaps we'll do that when I'm next in Bournemouth. So we have the son of Pigo. The ram's horn blown at fixed times, fixed days, even fixed hours of the day. Every Jew knew when it was going to go off. The silver trumpet, not so. It could technically go off any time, any hour of any day. With these things in view, turn with me, please, back to the book of Numbers, chapter 10. Whenever you see these trumpet passages in the Old Testament, likewise, in Amos, set the trumpet to your lips, or in the book of Joel, or in Zephaniah, when the trumpet is sounded, will the people not in the city not tremble? You have to understand, is it talking about a ram's horn, or is it talking about a silver trumpet? You have to understand each passage, which horn is being blown and why. But let's look now at Numbers 10. The Lord spoke further to Moses, saying, Make yourself two trumpets. Notice two. Hence the Hebrew term, Hatsutzot, is plural. Make two of them. There are two. Make yourself two trumpets of silver, of hammered work. You shall make them, and you shall use them for summoning the congregation and for having the camps set out. Now notice the functions. The functions of the silver trumpet. Convocation. Convocation. As we'll see, alarm in a moment. Okay. Proclamation, as we'll see in a moment, but also to set out a signal 
to depart. A signal to leave. Made from silver. Silver is one of the three holy metals used in the construction of the tabernacle and the temple and its artifacts. The temple in Jerusalem followed the same configuration as the tabernacle in the wilderness. Everything outside, like the lavender and the brazen altar, was nechoshet, nechoshet, brass, bronze. As you proceeded inward, there was more hesef, silver. But when you get to the Holy of Holies, it was all zahav, pure, unbeaten gold. Gold is a non-oxidizing metal. It won't rust. Hence Jesus' parable, store up treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust will consume them. Gold will not rust. It's a non-oxidizing metal. Metal, it represents that which is eternal. Silver is also a precious metal, but it is only of temporary value. It will oxidize. It's of value, but only of temporary value. Silver has to do in Scripture with the price of salvation. The price of salvation. This goes back to the half shekel of silver for the firstborn, Jesus being the firstborn of the Father, the half shekel of silver for the firstborn. Jesus, of course, was betrayed for silver. Silver has to do with the price of salvation. For iron, I'll give you silver. For brass, I'll give you gold. Trade in your silver for the gold. Silver, the price of salvation. Before man falls, you don't see silver in Genesis. And after all things are restored, you don't see silver. It's a value. It's of important value, but its importance is temporary. Its importance is temporary. In other words, we were created to be God's children. Although God knew we will fall, and although we will be eternally grateful for our salvation, we'll be eternally grateful to Jesus for taking our sin to give us his righteousness, for dying our death to give us his life, although we'll always be grateful for those things, we were not created to be saved. That's not a raison de tre. That's a vital interruption. <laughs> but it's not why we were created. We were created to be God's children. Be that as it may, it's of temporary value. The Hebrew word for silver is kesef. The Hebrew word for money is kesef. No distinction in Hebrew. Money's a value, but it's of temporary value. How much money you have? Kama kesef yeshlacha. How much money you have? How much silver? Hebrew, even in modern Hebrew, will be the same exact term. Even in modern Hebrew, the same exact term. God says, make these trumpets out of silver. We have a mission in proclaiming salvation and in proclaiming the return of Jesus. We are to invest our silver in it. We should put our money into things like missions and evangelism. It's the only way to take it with you, is to cash it in for gold. Invest in the silver. Invest the silver in the message. That's the only way to take it with you, is to cash it in for gold. It's a temporary value. The world, the world uses people to get kesef. God and the faithful church use kesef to get people. The world uses people to get money. God uses money to get people. The world uses people to get money. Crooked tele-evangelists, these con artists, heretics, and apostates. You see on the Godless Channel and on Revelation TV, they use people to get money. They do what the world does because they are of the world. 
They think the same as unsaved people. They play the same game, except they pervert the gospel to reach that end. It's of temporary value. Invest in it. Make these trumpets. We have a message. Well, let's see. It goes on. When one are blown, all the congregation shall gather themselves to you at the door of the tent of meeting. Yet if only one is blown, the leaders, the heads of the divisions of Israel, shall assemble before you. But when you blow an alarm, the camps that are pitched on the east side shall set out. Please notice the detail. When you blow an alarm the second time, the camps that are pitched on the south side shall set out. An alarm is to be blown for them to set out. It's a signal to leave. When convening the assembly, however, you shall blow without sounding an alarm. The priestly sons of Aaron, that is the Levites, moreover, shall blow the trumpets, and this shall be for you a perpetual statute throughout your generations. When you go to war in your land against the adversary who attacks you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets that you may be remembered before the Lord your God and be saved from your enemies. Also, in the day of your gladness and in your appointed feasts, on the first day of your month, that is the lunar month, following the lunar 28-day cycle, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings. And they shall be as a reminder of you before your God, I am the Lord your God. Let's begin at the beginning by beginning at the end. Once a month, there was a time that was fixed when everybody knew the trumpets were going to be blown. The Levites, the sons of Aaron, had to be sure that the people knew the signals and what they meant. Now, this was to be practiced not just in the mobile tent of meeting, but in Jerusalem, following the same geographical pattern and configuration. What do you mean to set out? Well, to set out when you're in a tent in the wilderness, that makes sense when the Shekinah was moving. But it obviously has some other meaning if you had to blow these trumpets in Jerusalem, which was to be stationary. It's pointing, of course, to the final rescue that we read about in Daniel 12. It's pointing to the return of Jesus. Well, let's understand this further. Every month, the people had to know. They were drilled. They knew the signals. Was that one trumpet, meaning the leaders to convocate, or was it two trumpets? Was it a shofar? Or was it a salapigo? Which bugle was it? Was it one blast? Or two blasts? They knew what the signals meant ahead of time. Every month they were drilled. In Israel, this is vital to this day, the way it was in Britain during the Blitz. Everybody knows. It's going to be an air raid drill tomorrow. It'll be on television, on the internet, on the radio, and in the newspapers. Tomorrow at 12 o'clock is going to be a drill. Everybody knew. Everybody knew. Well, if those trumpets went off at any other time, other than that time, the teachers in the school... Quick, get the kids into the shelter and distribute breathing apparatus, gas masks. They knew this was it. 
they knew the signal ahead of time. The Katushas are coming. The people in Starot or Metula or up in the, you know, the very, the very north of Israel around Metula and Kiryat Shemona. The Katushas are coming. Quick, get the kids in the shelter. It's an attack. People in, 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 in Nahariya, quick, head for the shelters. They know. Everybody knows. The Levites had to make sure they knew. They had to make sure the people knew which trumpet. Was it a salapigo or was it a shofar? And they had to know which signal. If only one was blown, it was a signal for the leaders. God is going to speak to the leaders. In theory, the leaders should know before the people. The pastors, teachers, should be hearing from the Lord before the people. In theory, they should know what's coming before it comes. The shepherd should know what's ahead before the sheep do. It's supposed to work like that. If it's two blasts, it's a signal for everybody. God wants to speak. Everybody convocate. Something's happening. Something's coming. The Lord's trying to tell us something. This is for everybody if it was two. But then look what it says. When you blow an alarm, the camps that are pitched on the east side shall set out. And when you blow an alarm the second time, notice there's the first trumpet and the second. Everybody see that? Many of you have been to Jerusalem. How many of you have been there? A lot of you. Well, if you've been there, you know that the, again, the same geographical configuration in biblical times is more or less what it is now. More or less what it is now. The necropolis, where people are buried to this day, is on the east side of the old city and down into the lower Kidron. It... Uh, up to the slope of the Mount of Olives. It's the oldest Jewish cemetery in the world. It was active in the time of Jesus. We know that Jesus would have come through the cleft in the Mount of Olives because if he even came into indirect contact with a grave or an ostuary, he would have been ritually defiled and could not have celebrated the Passover, but he did. He celebrated the Last Supper. That cemetery is still operational. You can still see the Hasmonean pillars where they believe Absalom's tomb was on the east side. About five years ago, maybe five and a half years ago, the tombs of the kings were discovered in Silwan, in the original city, Jebusite city of David. You can see them. They are on the east side. The dead people were on the east side. Still are. Still are. To the south of the Temple Mount, the people who lived on the south that was the original city of David. To the south and to the southwest, up to the Hill of Evil Council, was where the living population was. So the live people were in the south. The dead people were on the east. Still like that. When you blow the first trumpet, it's for the ones on the east. The dead in Christ rise first. Blow the second trumpet, the last one. First and the last, the people on the south. We shall meet them in the air. There's the first trumpet, and there's the last trumpet. You understand? It's a signal to get out. Look what it says next. Verse 
verse 7, when convening the assembly, however, you shall blow without sounding an alarm. This was a big issue. Still is. No false alarms. You drop your wallet or your purse accidentally on the street of London, good luck. <laughs> Kiss it goodbye. You drop it on the street in Tel Aviv, and you come back in 10 minutes, it will most likely still be there, surrounded by 200 policemen on the bomb squad. <laughs> then a little robot is going to pick it up, take it into a mobile detonation unit, <laughs> and blow it to pieces. Kiss it goodbye. <laughs> No false arms. This is a big problem and it's getting worse. You will not know the day or the hour. I go back to 1987. They had these fundamentalist Baptists from America who came to Speaker's Corner in London. 88 reasons why Jesus will be back Yom Kippur on <laughs> that year. They were telling people, they were telling the Muslims, we'll be gone within 48 hours. Of course, when he didn't show up, they went into the Jehovah's Witness routine. We've got the year wrong. It's going to be 1988. <laughs> then there was the Y2K fiasco. R.C. Sproul and Co. Then there was Harold Camping. Three times he called it wrong. And when they call it wrong, they do the same thing as the Jehovah's Witnesses. Play the same game. Cognitive dissonance. Now it's the blood moon. <laughs> what ignorant crackpots. I don't mean them. They're making money on it. I mean the people paying attention to them. If you click on the NASA website, only one of those eclipses is even partially visible in the Middle East. You want to be where the action is? You have to go to Tahiti or Fiji or the South Pacific. Those things are not even visible in the Middle East. People can't even see them in Israel. No false alarms, because when people blow false alarms, when the real thing happens, you invoke the boy who cried wolf phenomenon. People will just think it's another crackpot talking rubbish, the way they talked rubbish about Y2K, etc. They'll think it's another Harold Camping or whatever the latest coup coming down the pike with his merchandise is. This is serious business. No false alarms. No false alarms. That's pretty important. When you're under attack, that God will remember you for salvation. And then there's a fifth one we'll come to. We've got quite a situation today. 
Which trumpet? People don't know the difference between the shofar and the salapigo. They don't know. Now, to put this in perspective, we have to go back to the beginning, to Revelation. The voice of God is represented by different things in different contexts in Scripture. Okay. When the voice of God is represented by thunder, it's only so the people of God will understand it. The others will hear the noise, but won't know what it means. Remember, this is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. Only the people of God will understand what God is saying. The others will hear something, but they won't know what it means. Pick up a newspaper any day of the week. Russia becoming military active again, siding with Iran. The stage is being set for some kind of Gog and Magog, it would appear. The whole thing in Syria, read Isaiah 17. The whole thing with Iran, read Daniel 10. These politicians in Washington and Whitehall don't have a clue. They're godless men. Nations that have turned their back on God will get the leaders they deserve. Godless nations like America and Britain and Israel get godless leaders most of the time. These people like Bush and Obama and Cameron, these are God's judgment. We get the leaders we deserve. Godless nations will have godless leaders. Look at the church. Look at the church. Godless churches, the Archdruid of Canterbury, whatever it is, godless church is going to get godless leaders. So when God speaks, only those who are truly his are going to know what he's saying. The others will hear something, but they won't know what it means. That's when it's thunder. Okay. Sometimes the voice of God is represented as the sound of many waters. That's when he's speaking to nations. They may hear it, but it'll be too late. <laughs> they may hear it, but it'll be... Too late, sound of many waters. Sometimes it's choral. It's choral, like in Revelation. That is when the Tseba Ota Shemaim, Angelic hosts and things, are making a proclamation uh, with the voice of God, and it's being re recognized by singing a refrain back. Well, that. It's in the Song of Solomon, it's in Revelation. It's in the Nativity narrative of Jesus' birth. But then you have the trumpet. When God speaks and his voice is compared to a trumpet, it's a signal designed to invoke a reaction. You're supposed to do something about it. Well, the people are supposed to know. However, Satan is aware that the people of God are supposed to know. So Satan has raised up people in his employ, in his kingdom service. One is Mark Driscoll in the United States, a man who serves the interest of the devil, who teaches young people to mock those who study end-time prophecy. He also thinks it's somehow hip and relevant to use vulgar language. Now, I have no problem addressing sexual issues and things like this, but why the vulgarity? Why the vulgarity? In church, his treatment of the Song of Solomon was a theological farce anyway. The doctrine was rubbish. It, 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 it's just a, it's a sex thing. That he, and the way he was talking about it, it was just... Unbelievable. Mark Driscoll. Rick Warren, avoid end time prophecy. It's a diversion. What about Jesus? Jesus saying, be alert, watch out for these things. Who cares what Jesus Christ said? We've got Rick Warren. 
Who needs the New Testament if you have the purpose-driven lie written by the purpose-driven liar? Tell him I said so. Jesus said, be alert. Watch out for these things. Look how few churches are teaching prophecy in the return of Jesus. We're getting closer to it by the year, by the month. Yet there was more interest in it 40 years ago than there is now. That is a deception in itself. Now you've got Christian Palestinianism, Stephen Sizer, Gary Burke, and their lies, denying the prophetic significance of Israel. A lie of the devil that was amplified by the late John Stott, somebody who Martin Lloyd-Jones warned about 40 years ago. Martin Lloyd-Jones was right. I wish this country had listened to Martin Lloyd-Jones instead of to that false teacher, Stotty Wadi. Of course, he's since changed his opinion. He gave up the ghost. <laughs> If my language sounds harsh, you understand the states involved in what we're dealing with? This is a high stakes game, except it's no game. The clergy are supposed to make sure that people know what's being blown and what it means. Is it one trumpet? Is God trying to speak to the leaders? When the leaders are saying, avoid prophecy, what do you expect from the people? If the leaders won't hear one trumpet, how are the people going to hear two? How many people come to meetings like this primarily because you're not being taught the Word of God, not just the prophecy, but you're not being taught doctrine and the Word of God in your church, so you come to things like this? Put your hand up. Look around. That will be the same all over Britain, all over Australia, all over America, all over South Africa. I mean, there are churches who do teach the Word of God. But they're the minority now. Yeah, they're the minority now. The people don't know which trumpet. They don't know the signals. The leaders don't know the signals. And then on top of that, there's the false alarms. So the people who should be blowing the alarms aren't, and the ones who are are blowing false ones. What a mess! The mainstream pastors should be blowing the alarms, but they're not. People don't realize persecution is on the horizon. The people are not being taught to prepare for the future. I remember Satan was lying, and he had a whole core of liars working for him, saying revival was coming. This is revival. This is blessing. They were laughing and all this falling down drunk. Don't worry, the revival's come. This is re Satan had a whole core of messengers called the Elam clergy in this country. They should have been telling people persecution is coming. They grabbed that 69-year-old evangelist. 69 years old, arrested by a lesbian policewoman. When homosexuals attacked him in Bournemouth, they arrested him for a hate crime because he was simply telling people to repent. Didn't arrest the people who were throwing water and dirt at him and cursing at him. They arrested him. The Crown spent 2,500 pounds to fly one witness from Australia against him. An old man preaching, well, people being forced to pay 1,500 pounds each to two homosexuals because they didn't want homosexuality going on in their B&B. &B. This is only the beginning. 
Instead of blowing the alarm and telling people what's coming, they're telling people, oh, we're having a revival. And well, that's the bad news. Now let's look at the worst news. <laughs> then I'll tell you the good news. Turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 14, please. 1 Corinthians 14. Verses 7 and 8, yet even lifeless things, either flute or harp, in producing a sound, if they do not produce a distinction in tones, how will it be known what is being played on the flute or the harp? Once again, which instrument is being played and what is being played? Verse 8, for if the bugle, the solipigo, produces an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? In this epistle, Paul is addressing the problem of charismania as opposed to charismata. The theological term for charismania is neomontanism. Neomontanism. Colloquially, some people just call it charismania, not to be confused with charismata. I'm not a cessationist. I do believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Those who say they ended with the apostles are teaching error. They did not end with the apostles. They are being counterfeited, but they did not end with the apostles. Do not pay attention to people like John MacArthur. Nonetheless, let's look at this. The people have to know what's being played to know what to do. The American jazz great, the founder of the big band jazz sound, was a black American named Duke Ellington. He had Christians in his family, and he became a Christian in his middle years. And throughout his life, he played both Christian and secular music, but he ran everything in Christian terms. He didn't allow his musicians to gamble and curse and all this kind of stuff. And smoke. He, he was a Christian. He became, I don't know if he'd always been, but he had certainly become a Christian in, by the time he was middle-aged and he had believers in his family. Most black Americans do. Anyway, Duke Ellington founded the big band sound that was copied by people like Benny Goodman and Glenn Miller. It became popular in this country during the Second World War. But Duke Ellington bemoaned the fact that something happened to jazz that he didn't like. He said, it's not fun anymore. Jazz stopped being fun when people could no longer dance to it. Jazz music began in the American South, in New Orleans, it was adopted from the Afro-American gospel tradition. We think of these as fun songs, but originally they were worship songs in black American churches in the American South. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Oh, when... That comes from the book of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Revelation. To them, originally, it was not a happy, clappy pop song. It was actually... Church music. Josh fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Josh fought the battle of Jericho, and the walls came and tumbled. To them, that was originally church music. They'd go on like this. Who's that a writing John the Revelator? Who's that writing John the Revelator? 
Who's that writing? John the Revelator wrote the Book of the Seven Seal. Things like this. And they'd have these huge choirs, and they'd sing in two-part vocal harmony, and the tempo of the music, they would move with it. They'd go like that. Them bones, them bones, them dry bones, here the word of the Lord. Well, jazz copied this and secularized it. That's how jazz began. But in time, something happened. This guy came along who was a clever musician, but he thought jazz music should be improvisational. His name was John Coltrane. And he thought that jazz should be sort of like the music of India. It should have no set harmonic structure, no sheet music. You just compose it as you go along. That there'd be a, a dynamism, an interaction between the musicians feeling the beat and the groove and they would just make it up as they went along. So the drummer would play, they play the drums with brushes so the beat wouldn't be too strong so anybody could not have to stick to a particular beat. And then they'd have the guy with a double bass filling in. You know, just. And then they'd play the brass instruments the same. You know, harmony. Or at least there was, there'd be a harmony, but there'd be no melody, no structured melody. And Duke Ellington didn't like this. This was not the jazz that he knew. He said, people can't even dance to this. So jazz became known as something called musician's music. The only people who could appreciate it anymore were the people who were playing it. <laughs> musicians. This guy, Ronnie Scott, saw this in New York. He worked on this Jewish guy. I remember him. He worked on the steamships. And he came and he opened the club in Soho that's still there, Ronnie Scott's. And jazz just became the music of these jazz clubs, where it was only for musicians and a handful of aficionados to hang out, but it was not the popular music anymore. Young people turned their rhythm and blues because they could dance to it, and rock and roll and so forth, replaced jazz. Duke Ellington said, it's not fun anymore. People can't dance to it. Well, Paul takes the situation in 1 Corinthians, and he applies it to a military scenario. Up until the dawn of the 20th century, from the time of Philip of Macedonia, the father, father of Alexander the Great, all the way until the dawn of the 20th century, signals were relayed in the heat of battle to soldiers by the blast of a bugle or a trumpet. Ever since Philip of Macedonia, the Romans did it, the French did it, the British did it, everybody, there was always a trumpet. Our soldiers were trained ahead of time to know what to do in the heat of battle. The battle is a chaotic environment, it's like a rugby game. You can have a plan, but as soon as the ball is in play, anything can happen. In what is inherently a chaotic situation, commands were relayed by a trumpet. The soldiers were trained ahead of time to know what to do by the trumpet. Charge! Recall! Go to sleep! They all knew what to do ahead of time. It was no good going into a battle not knowing what the signals were, because even if they were blown, they'd mean nothing to you. Now again, in the heat of battle, an inherently chaotic situation anyway, suppose the general relays a command. But the trumpeteer decides to go into a Dizzy Gillespie thing. <laughs> he tries his Miles Davis imitation. <laughs> he just begins going with the groove, you know, man. <laughs> begins improvising on the battlefield. What is already chaotic will immediately, automatically, disintegrate into sheer pandemonium. That has what has happened in the church. You've got nuts. The Kansas City false prophets, Bill Johnson, crazy people, mystics, Gnostics, people calling prophecy that's only clairvoyance. I had a vision, the Lord gave me a picture. 
tongues that are in tongues. Copeland and Rodney Brown clowning in tongues. Now the Pope sent the greeting to Copeland. They deserve each other. Anybody can play anything. What's the result going to be when the attack comes? Who will prepare himself for battle? <laughs> Only the people who know ahead of time. What a mess. The Levites were to make sure the people knew which trumpet, but they're not doing it. That the people understood the signals. Here's what this means. Here's what we should do. But they're not teaching it. Harold Camping, Y2K, Blood Moons. No false alarms. But they're blowing one after another. And then we're under attack. You got people going around playing anything. Don't have a clue. What a mess. What a mess. And it's getting worse. That's the bad news. That's the bad news. Now, let's look at the good news. What else does it say in Numbers 10? What is that proclamation? What is the fifth purpose of the silver trumpets? Verse 10 of Numbers 10, Bemi Dbar. Also in the day of your gladness. Gladness? What on earth is there to be glad about? A proclamation of gladness, of simcha. What is there to be glad about in a mess like that? Because Jesus said, when you see these things happening, when you see this mess coming down, when this stuff comes upon the world, when you see this stuff overtaking those who are not prepared ahead of time, when it happens, and it's going to happen, when you see this mess happening, lift up your head and rejoice, for your redemption draws near. God bless.